The first thing is to applaud the engineering profession for taking this giant step and wanting to be counted on the issue of anti-corruption and good ethics. Corruption hurts and it takes away resources that should be ensuring a better life for all of our people. And engineers can play a, a role through regulating themselves and acting ethically to ensure that those projects that are co-implemented between them and government are implemented with integrity and according to whatever has been agreed to. We can all take a stand, firstly by acting ethically, secondly reporting wrongdoing when we see it. We, we get a lot of whistleblowers who know that there was wrongdoing, that a tender was not issued appropriately or the work that was paid for was not done or was not done properly. So people can whistleblow. But ultimately, companies that are involved in these matters should make sure that they supervise their own people and ensure that their people do not should change government because when we should change government, we're should changing ourselves because all of these things come back to head society as a whole. Thank you for that kind uh, introduction, Mr. Nehem Play. Greetings on behalf of the Public Protector team to all of you ladies and gentlemen who are here today. A special greeting to the President of the South African Institute for Civil Engineering, Mr. Stanford Mkatsani to the President-elect of SAIS, Mr. Malcolm Pauls, to the Vice President, Mr. Tom McCune, past presidents and other members of the Executive Board, other executive officials, general members, and the media. It is an honor for me to address you during this crucial Congress under the theme, The Engineering Revolution. I thank the organizers for inviting me. I apologize for messing up the schedule. In terms of the original invitation, I was supposed to speak to you tomorrow, but due to other obligations I have, I have to speak today. It's quite amazing I should be speaking to engineers today. About two days ago, I was speaking to a friend who is an engineer and who seriously thinks that engineering or the world revolves around engineering. Actually, he suggested to me. <laughs> this friend suggested to me that everyone should study engineering, regardless of what profession they're going to go into. I'm not sure whether he was right, but one thing I have discovered as somebody who's running an organization, is that every organization needs an engineer, regardless of the nature of the organization. And we have since appointed an engineer to assist us with our organizational design, process review, and re-engineering of our processes. I was curious, why would engineers be interested in a topic such as corruption and ethics? In the infrastructure engineering industry. 
Much as I was curious, I, just, I, I realized though that it's not the first time I come across engineers who have an interest in issues other than engineering business. I'm a member of the World Justice Forum, and some of the very active members of the World Justice Forum are engineers. And I've heard from them explain why it is important for them to be part of the World Justice Forum. They've indicated to me that the rule of law should not just be the concern of lawyers. We all live in society, and how society is managed affects everyone. And of course, if you are in the engineering industry, you'd like to know that when you get contracts, those contracts firstly will be issued in accordance with the law, and secondly, should things go wrong, the rule of law is going to be respected. Why an interest in corruption? I suspect part of the reason you'd have an interest in corruption is because you want a level playing field. As professionals, you'd like to know that if you run a company that operates with integrity and delivers excellent service, that will be good enough to get you business. You don't want to find yourself in a situation whereby you are the best in the field, but the deal goes to someone who is not even worthy to be considered. As I was reflecting on this address, I thought about a story that was told to us at a, an anti-corruption conference in a West African country. We were told a story about a man who was an engineer and owned a civil, he wasn't a civil engineer incidentally, and owned a very big and successful construction company. One day he got a call that told him that his daughter had died. And he, she was traveling in a school bus, and as she was traveling in the school bus, a bridge collapsed. What was remarkable was that the engineer wasn't so much concerned about the daughter, what really happened, you know, did she die instantly, was she taken to hospital? The only question he asked was, which bridge? The storyteller, the storyteller later told us about the bridge. It turned out that this very successful business person had built many things in society. And one of the things he had built was a bridge. And there was an opportunity given to him to make a decision whether or not to proceed with the construction project or to impair the whole project and start afresh. We are told, since I'm not an engineer, and I don't know whether you know 0, 0.000 something degrees uh, matters, but in this particular story we're told that something was skewed, but the, the extent to which it was skewed was to us ordinary people something minor, but to an engineer, it impacted on the strength of the structure. He was informed about that when they assessed the bridge as it was going up. He chose expediency at the time and said they must proceed regardless of the fact that the bridge or something was skewed. They concluded the bridge and he chose to pay the inspector, because it was an inspector who came to check the bridge and was suggesting that the bridge be, um, be destroyed and the whole project be started from square one. He paid off the inspector and the, the project proceeded. As life would have it, it turned out that the bus that had had an accident on a bridge that collapsed 
was on that very bridge that he had built and had decided to go ahead regardless of the circumstances. I would like to believe that the people in this particular room, you are here because you have an interest in doing your job with integrity. You know the kinds of people who would want to proceed when somebody has indicated that the foundations of RDP houses are flawed. I would like to believe that you are here because you are the kind, you are the kind of people who would start the project from square one in order that you have something that is structurally sound and that won't give us problems in the future. Civil engineering is one of the most critical aspects of infrastructure development. I was told by the organizers, to whom I'm grateful for this opportunity, that one of the things you are looking at is the National Development Plan. And the National Development Plan places a lot of emphasis on infrastructure development. And that's a great opportunity for our country and a great opportunity for professionals from all walks of life, lawyers, engineers, not just civil engineers, various kinds of engineers. That's a great opportunity. But there's also great risks as we go into the infrastructure development, there's great risks in terms of things not being done according to spec, not being done on time, and sometimes not being done at all. In his budget vote speech earlier this year, Finance Minister Pravin Gordon announced that government will invest a staggering 847 billion rand in infrastructure development over the next three years. He told the joint sitting of parliament that about one trillion rand had already been spent in infrastructure development in the last five years. The massive infrastructure investment is not only meant to develop our cities, towns, townships and rural communities, but it is also aimed at improving the quality of life of South Africans, as we've already noted. Through the construction of roads, railway lines, ports, power stations, hospitals, schools, dams, and shelter, the vision, the constitutional vision that promises our people an improved quality of life is going to be realized. Of course, uh, the constitutional vision is not dependent only on infrastructure. There are various aspects of life that need to be addressed through service delivery. But things such as quality transportation, electricity, public health care, education, water, sanitation, and housing are key to an improved quality of life. Why so? Because the Constitution promises everyone an improved quality of life in the preamble. But inside the Constitution, particularly in Chapter 3 of the Constitution, that quality of life is given a concrete expression in the form of a Bill of Rights. That Bill of Rights promises people the right to human dignity, right to equality, right to various social and economic rights. And those eco social and economic rights include access to health care, education, water, food, and housing, among other things. But for infrastructure to be developed, we need skills, we need knowledge, we also need discipline. You've asked me to speak about ethics and corruption, 
And I would like to get into that particular field right now. We know that government does not deliver its own infrastructure. Government lays the foundation, sets the rules, and provides the money. It is professionals from all walks of life that give meaning to these promises on infrastructure. As we look at the National Development Plan, we are looking at professionals coming to the party. Why should we be concerned about corruption in that particular context? Well, as I indicated, as I was preparing this speech, I thought about that engineer and what he did and how it came back to hurt him and hurt other people. Of course, we know that he, he was hurt because his daughter died. Other people's daughters died as well. But society suffered as well in a, in a sense that for a little while there was no breach and therefore that road could not be used. And secondly, more money had to be found to restore the breach. That is why corruption matters. What is corruption? Corruption is defined in the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act as an act where one party is influenced by another to make a decision that is self-serving for gratification. In other words, I make a decision that I wouldn't have made that benefits the person who is influencing me to make that decision for gratification. That person gives me gratification. For corruption to happen, there has to be two parties. If we go back to the breach that I spoke about, there was an inspector, there was the business owner. The business owner was the corrupter, corrupted the inspector by saying, let's make a deal. And in the end, the project proceeded when they should have taken a step back. And that's how really corruption occurs in society, in, in, in various areas of life. In South Africa and, and, and elsewhere in the world, we talk about two kinds of corruption. What we call retail corruption, corruption which is very transactional and very small scale. And then we have grand corruption, which often involves many parties. If I go back to the case I started with, in, in such a case, corruption would involve multiple parties, the inspector, his underlings, and other parties who were supposed to sign off on that breach. 